So our last speaker in this session, we're going to move out of terrestrial and into marine, uh, I think finally for some of the folks who are in the marine realm. Uh, so I'm really pleased to introduce Judy Peterson, who's a research scientist at MIT Sea Grant, and she'll be talking about rain shifts in marine invasions and what to expect from those. And so your battery died. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, how many of you are marine biologists? Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to show you some pretty pictures of my other things today. So, uh, um, let's see. Yes. So let me give you. We're going to talk about marine shifts in uh, in marine bio or with marine bio invasions. So I thought that uh, what I will do is give you kind of a quick overview of what marine bioinvasions we have here in the Northeast, talk about some of the special challenges that we face with marine organisms uh, because a, there's a lot of taxonomic diversity, it's tough to find people who are good at identifying the native and the non-native, and there are fewer taxonomists, more and more uh, uh, sort of a dry, dying breed. <clears throat> um, we want to um, talk about some of the complex life histories that they have, complexity of the habitats, and so, you know, that, that's also a very much of a problem. Their life histories are such that for the following organisms we're going to be talking about mostly today, uh, have, you know, they attach to something hard, but their larvae are usually spread out into the water, and they get distributed very quickly that way as well. So it makes it more difficult to kind of talk to them. And then, um, I'm having a hard time reading this with, I need my glasses here. Okay, and uh, then there are, as I said, multiple microhabitats. Um, we're going to talk about the climate change and the uh, ability to predict their movements and talk a little bit about rain shifts and the difference between a rain shift and a regime shift and, you know, how difficult it is to really talk about what's going to happen in the future, but I will talk about some of the future directions. And then I have two algae that are why we need a uh, taxonomist. One is native and one is not. The uh, Dacisophonia is na non-native. The other one is the polysophonia is native. And it's uh, difficult to try to tell them apart. What we've done in the Northeast was bring together uh, taxonomists. Jen Dykstra was one of them, uh, who are able to identify native and non-native species with the goal of trying to see what we have in uh, the northeast from Maine down to New York City. We look specifically at floating docks because they're in the water, they go up and down with the tide, and so you're always looking sort of at the same level of <clears throat> underwater organisms and their associated um, communities as well. Mostly they're filing organisms attached to the docks. We do field identifications, but that actually isn't good enough. Everybody brings, we go and visit three docks in a day. That's why we use that in part. We come back to the lab, identify these species to two species basically as best we can, and make sure that the um, we have a good uh, representation. We then voucher these specimens. They're at the Museum of Comparative Zoology, if any of you are interested. And, <clears throat> and then we try to have them uh, as a downloadable thing. So we're talking about organisms that are going to compete for space. We're talking about organisms that come here primarily from shipping on the hulls of ships or in ballast water, and the ballast tank can have 2,000, 200,000 gallons of water, and there are several of them in these huge vessels. They make it across the ocean and from Europe in a few days, so good potential for uh, introductions. And some of them have come in from aquaculture as well. We make sure I say those things before we go on. Uh, what did we find? We found, uh, we visited about 119 species from 2000 to 2013 in our six of our surveys. We <clears throat> identified 50 uh, non-native species out of the 570 species or so that we identified totally. 25% of those were macroalgae, and 60, uh, for the native species, 16% of them were macroalgae for the non-natives. But even with the taxonomic experts, it's really often difficult, and many of the specimens often get sent off to people uh, on a really worldwide, global basis to help us identify these species. Keep in, and really focusing on this because if you want to know the difference, what, what impact a non-native species has, you really need to know it's non-native. Otherwise, it's very difficult to tell. And I keep using non-natives instead of invasives. To me, the grapevine in my backyard that comes in from the neighbor and kills my pine trees is an invasive, uh, but you know, 
it's not necessarily a non-native. So we're talking about non-natives, which in general we, we really don't want to be here. And then uh, the distributions are defined really by temperature and salinity, as we, uh, we will see in a few minutes. So this is a map of where we have visited the extremes, uh, the northern Maine, mid-Maine, New Hampshire, northern Massachusetts, southern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Long Island Sound, and New York. The two extreme ends, we only visited once. The areas in the middle, we visited quite a bit. So we have a lot more data from there. The, the graph on the right is of the non-native uh, non species that we found. The red bars indicate that the species has shown up in at least two or more of these regions that I sort of arbitrarily defined by uh, temperature. The blue are the ones that only have shown up in that particular region. Uh, as you can see, <clears throat> we had very few species from the very northern area, and you can also see that the temperature is quite cold. Uh, as we go down the coast, um, it goes from 17, 19, and so forth. Now, on any given year, it may be higher or lower, and this is just representing the mean, but it more or less gives you a sense of what's going on. So if I were going to look for range shifts, I would start looking at these blue species to see which of those were being moved north. Okay, uh, and the range shift, obviously, it's going to occur not only with these non-native species, but it's going to occur with the native species. And the in marine species, it's often, well, when you're looking at four or five to one native to non-native, you, you have really quite a mix. But what we have found in the sites where we've gone back year after year, there's also a great deal of variability in both the native and the non-native species. Not always related to temperature, not always related to salinity, but um, just simply the population. Again, you think of what's going on in the marine environment as a plankton, somebody's eating it, it may or may not survive the next year. So it's a very complex thing and trying to get all those uncertainties and modeling this would be very complex. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the need to really have a lot of information if you want to talk about these range shifts causing regime changes, that is changes in the populations. And uh, Jen, I think, has some data on that and I'll have a few things to talk about. Um, Okay, so one of the other things that we really set out when we were, we were working on a paper in Europe uh, looking at climate change was the need to make sure you understood what you meant by climate change. Species in New England or anywhere that come in have a lag time before they start to take off. And if you check them in some period in time and you look at this particular community, it may or may not be at the end of its range. So you don't really know how far north it's going to go. So what we did, we set out some criteria to look at some of these introduced species. <clears throat> so they had to be introduced. You had to know what they were. Uh, you need to make sure that you understood the, um, the, the history of these organisms in the peer-reviewed literature and also how and what they were doing in terms of reproduction. Was a reproductive reproduction output increasing because they were be able to reproduce earlier and continue longer or not? And what are their phenologies? And then finally, <clears throat> um, have they also been shown to have an impact somewhere else? So that you were really interested in, in understanding how these range shifts were actually impacting organisms. So I'm giving you two examples here. One of the uh, Chinese uh, the Asian shore crab, excuse me, uh, Hemigrapsis sanguineus. It was found in, I think, around 1988, if I remember correctly, in uh, New Jersey, where the arrow is, and then spread northward, and by 2009 was found uh, with reproducing populations north of um, Portland, Maine, and also continued on down <coughs> to, uh, to North Carolina. In general, if you relied on scientists to give you this information, you might see a spot here in Portland, you might see one in New Hampshire because of Jen, you might see one further south because of some uh, somebody doing the work down there. This was done by a group of students. So a, a graduate student organized high school students to go out, pick up these crabs, measure them, and get their sex, and was able to generate a graph like this. Nice. 
The other one is also good in terms of being able to talk about the distribution, again, of an organism that came in in 1838 uh, or 1840 in Pictou, uh, Nova Scotia, and marched down the, the coast. You can see by 19, 1875, it was down in Boston, and then continued on down into Virginia. This species has since, I checked with the person who did the genetics on it because there was some controversy about whether it was or wasn't native, uh, who did some genomics, and she said that she actually got it all the way back, or it's gone all the way up into Labrador now. So it's gone further, further north again. Um, the point is that it takes some time for these things to go, and it also takes, um, <clears throat> um, and they go at different rates. So for the, for the snail, it's coming down with the coastal current that comes down the coast. The crab, it's going against the coastal current and rising up. Complications. All right, so some recent introductions that we've seen, again, it's going to show two things. One, it doesn't go at a steady, steady speed. You would think that the algae, which has spores and has shown, been shown to have a fairly fast Inter, or a fast transport rate actually is slower sometimes than the bryozoan at the top, which uh, the, the first date is the date of report, first date of report, the second one is where we've seen it uh, most recently, and it has really spread just like wildfire. Um, the uh, shrimp, again, we thought this one would go very quickly, and it has moved but not quite as fast as some of the other species that we find. Um, we see this also, we see these spreading of organisms with native species as well. And this is largely uh, sort of verbal reports from scientists like Larry Harris and others who are doing a lot of diving. And you can see there's a number of fish that are moving and you're seeing also a number of uh, uh, crabs. And the interesting thing here again is that fact that they're breeding. So we see things going north and now staying and breeding. Will they stay there as the climate gets colder? Perhaps not. My experience was um, in the University of Maine with a student who was doing work on the silver sides. I always want to say it's Mimidia. I always confuse it with, a, with a, uh, another species. Anyway, <clears throat> he'd come up, done his work one summer, all set. He's going to do his digestive uh, look at this, the data. Came back the next summer, none there because in Gloucester, you have the Labrador current that comes in and keeps it cool. So for the ocean, we have a lot of different things going on at any given time that really kind of interfere with a lot of these things. We're also seeing some warm water species coming in. The one uh, on the right, Hydroides elegans, was a small worm. It had come, it's subtropical, it had come in to Woods Hall at the same time this Tricellaria came in, which is the bryzone I showed you earlier. Um, stayed for two winters because it was very warm that winter, and then has completely disappeared. So Garcia elegans we, we found in the waters from 2000 to 2011. It turns out it was very successful living near a power plant that had a warm water discharge. And so it stayed only in this one area and then was, has disappeared. One of the few times so we've been able to show an organism disappearing. And then, of course, you all have been talking about some of the other things that are difficult to deal with, and that is the physiological adaptability of organisms. So um, <clears throat> in 1957, this green algae, Codium, came in, displaces seagrass, which is you know, a very valuable and important ecosystem for fish, for refuges, for organisms, and so forth. And um, People said it's not going to get north of Cape Cod. Well, it did. It migrated north of Cape Cod into southern Massachusetts. I did my thesis work in 1980 in Gloucester, and it wasn't there. Ten years later, I went back, and there it is. I said, oh, it's made it all the way up here. Well, no, because it turns out it came in in 1970 into Maine, and that northern species adapted and moved south. So again, you know, trying to predict those northern ranges is difficult if you have organisms that are very, very adaptable. And here's an example of one that is. And then the other thing we thought, well, I thought, well, okay. <laughs> we know a lot of species. We've worked with our Canadian friends. Why don't we see, because they were starting to see organisms come in, and they said, oh, these are new. My goodness, we're, we're having problems with our aquaculture. 
particularly with the ascidians or the sea sports that you see on the top there. So I thought, okay, let's, let's put these uh, lists together, see if we can find <clears throat> some species that we can start to follow as they move north. And it turns out a lot of these species have already been there. Part of the problem is that the further north you go, a lot of these species maybe were in uh, subtitly and they just didn't notice them. They hadn't been looking for them. In any event, it makes it very difficult to say, okay, here's a good place for us to start our looking at our regime shifts and our changes within the organism. So just to get back to what I think is really, you know, so complicating about all of this, and it's certainly been said by all of the speakers this morning, and this is my simplified diagram of, you know, how we are looking at these things and how we have to deal with them. We've got our native species. There are warm water and cold water preferences within this community that you're looking at. Same for the non-natives that are already there, warm water and cold water preferences. As you raise your temperatures, it's going to increase those that like the warmer water and they're going to increase and probably decrease the cold water ones. And then you might expect that the outcome could be the native species outcompete the non-natives because they're just better competitors, they're ecological engineers, they're able to predate on these other organisms and so forth. And then you can go through this again for the non-natives and those that are prefer preferentially warm or cold water. And then finally, you're going to have the new introductions coming in of the uh, species and the warm water ones. You certainly would expect that they will come in. The question is, will they or won't they be able to come into these communities? And that's hard to predict. We're finding that if you have a good, strong community, you get much less in terms of the non-native species. Um, <clears throat> However, <laughs> in 1987, Bruce Menge, from work that he, with Jane Lchenko, several of their students had done, looked at the inner, rocky intertidal areas in Massachusetts and developed this <clears throat> sort of ecological engineer um, relationship between Carcinus manus, the green crab, and Asterius, uh, which is the uh, local starfish, is starfish are two species that are major predators on snails, lapellus, new salad lapellus, and bivalves and barnacles, and um, a major herbivore, Litterina litteria, that, may, that, that um, preys on algae. And it turns out, of course, that both Carcinus and Litterina litteria are non native species. The time they didn't highlight that or, or note it. But again, you can see that these organisms have had significant impacts. Uh, Carcinus has, has been difficult for the aquacultures, has been um, changed the communities, obviously, of particularly shellfish and you know, any of the uh, bivalves and mussels in the area. But Litterina, in particular, has really kept some of these areas very clear of algae. So the lower shell. The lower right, well, yeah, your right um, photograph shows litterinids on a rock, which if you had taken all of those off, probably would have had some algae on them that you, you know, can't see. There are lots of other things that keep litterinids or algae from growing there, but usually it's uh, herbivores and so forth. Um, and then you can see a healthy looking community here. But even if you look at that healthy community underneath the algae, you can start to see signs of some of these non-native, in this case, ascidians or sea sports growing. They grow both by asexual and sexual reproduction, and they are able within the summertime to become very, very abundant. All right, I'm going to uh, sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about um, trying to understand risks, because I, I know we're going to be speaking about it this afternoon. So the the um, Chinese mitten crab <clears throat> is a species that uh, has been a problem throughout Europe and in several other places in the world, but a great deal is known about it. So we have a good history of its sort of general life cycle. We have a good history of the habitat that it lives in, and um, we have an understanding that it has made it to the United States and the Chesapeake, Delaware, and the Hudson River. So we wanted to see if we could predict where it would go 
up on the, through, throughout the Northeast, and we wanted to see if we could identify ahead of time so we could do a so-called rapid response in terms of uh, having this organism show up. We'd looked at, we had put a proposal together to look at, um, using gene bank to look at the larvae in the water column. They cut that out, of course, so that ends up your, that sort of eliminates that. But nonetheless, what you do know is that the crab needs to have a freshwater system. So it, as a young adult, it, or as a young juvenile, it migrates upstream stream, up to 500 kilometers in some cases. It turns around and comes back down to the estuary and it um, releases its eggs at the right time of the year where the temperatures are just right and the salinity is right. There are several molts of the larvae. It then metamorphoses in what's called a megalarvae, which is the, sort of the old last stage of the, the juveniles and the plankton, settles to the ground, becomes a juvenile, and goes back upstream. Very complicated. So what we did was we looked at the various aspects of that complicated lifestyle in terms of the size of the estuary, the size of the watershed, um, the rate at which the water moves out from the estuary because if it moves the larvae out into the ocean, they're not going to be able to metamorphose. They need a certain salinity um, <clears throat> and um, flushing and a few others. I think that's, that's probably about it. The flushing rate, I'm sorry, the, um, the head of the tide and um, so forth. And then we put that together and said, okay, how likely is it that they're going to be in these various places? So the reds are where it's very probable that they could survive in those kinds of conditions. The orange is where mm, maybe, uh, probably, but maybe, uh, and the yellow is very low probability. The interesting thing is, of course, <laughs> all of this shows that it's very likely that they're going to survive in the Hudson River where they are, although they haven't definitely done, said that that's a definite uh, population um, yet, but it's there and they have large uh, females that they have found in their eel traps, no less. Um, and then probably also Long Island Sound. The other interesting thing is that the Penobscot area comes out very high, and that's because they have um, a low flushing rate of a very large estuary, and so it's a possibility, but not as likely as it, it's more likely that it would show up in the Boston area first. Anyway, um, so I'm sort of going to pull this all together by giving you some of my thoughts about future directions. I think that we have to think about both native and non-native species as, and their, their range shifts as we try to understand uh, and, and really talk about the non-native impacts. And that means we really have to be able to identify the non-native species. Something's very difficult. I think that for us in the marine environment, genomics are really opening the door to understanding these native species or non-native species. Um, however, we're finding that there is also a real need for those who are doing the genetic studies to match up with those who are the taxonomists, so that when you put the data into the data banks, you know what you're speaking with, speaking about. There are lag time, <clears throat> there are long-term stu studies that are really needed. Um, I, I find that there are very, very few studies that really give you a good sense of, uh, of what's going on. And we really need to document this if we want to take a look. I think we have some places to begin. The species that are at the edge of their range and their range shift are likely to, to go ahead. And then for marine species, really prevention is the best uh, option that we have um, because once an organism gets into the marine speed, into the marine environment, it's almost impossible for us to eradicate it. And the only case that has happened is with um, an algae that uh, was found in California. It covered several hectares. They covered the area with, with big tarps. They threw uh, chlorine under it. They went in and handpicked. And of course, when you handpick, you break these algae up and then they all disperse and then resettle. It costs something like four or five million dollars just to clean this up. And the problem for us, again, as I said, it's coming in by boats, by ballast water, by the hulls of ships, and the likelihood of reintroductions is very high. So it's really a problem, but it needs to be done. And I think uh, I will thank all the people. There were many, many people involved.
uh, probably over 100, 150 people involved in our surveys. And uh, certainly the support people uh, were very important to keep us all going, and then a number of funders to make this all possible. And if you are interested in the kinds of variability we get in our ocean uh, over several years, the top of the yellow are the highest temperatures and or salinities, the lowest are the uh, lowest temperatures and salinities, the red dots are the um, they, that the temperature for this particular year, which is 2013, and the blue is the average. Gives you a good sense of how very variable things are. And of course, the water temp the water comes in in these large uh, amounts these days, as was pointed out earlier by Bradley. And so it's making that also a very complicated uh, part of the city story. Thank you.